Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are speaking with the great artist, the great portrait painter, Robert Shetterly, who has painted all of the wonderful portraits of activists and educators and truth tellers that you can find at the website Americans Who Tell the Truth. Dot org uh, and who has a number of books, one just coming out. If you're watching the video version of this at talkworldradio.org, uh, I'm holding it up, Portraits of Peacemakers. Uh, also, I should note the father of Aaron Shetterly, recent guest on Talk World Radio with his wonderful new book, Morningside. Uh, Robert Shetterly, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. It's wonderful to be with you. And, and in, in the spirit of disclosure, we should say that you are one of the portraits featured in the Peacemakers book. As uh, you should be. It, it's a, a terrific honor for me uh, to be one of the, the portraits featured in this book. Um, uh, how do you go about choosing the, the peep? Because there's a range here over 150, 200 years and all variety of people. And I'm sure there are many more people who could have been added. How do you, how do you choose? Now that, that problem of all the others that could, could or should have been in, included is, is very difficult. I, I choose people to paint for this whole series, the Portraits of Americans Who Tell the Truth series as uh, uh, often because of something that I am particularly uh, interested in myself or often because I get, I get because of these portraits, I get the opportunity to go in schools all over the country, everything from you know colleges to elementary schools. And the pictures that are particularly useful to me or the portraits that are particularly useful to me are the ones that have a great story with them. But I can tell a story that I, I know uh, young people will be interested in and inspired by and you know, one of the things that we say about these portraits is that they are models of courageous citizenship. You know, there's a great effort with this project, not just to, you know, make a catalog of people who achieved certain goals in in terms of racism or environment or climate or peace or whatever it is, but people whose stories will inspire young people to be better citizens by modeling themselves uh, on the people I painted. And I don't try to to paint people who are, you know, all on pedestals or heroes. I mean, the kind that seem make them then seem out of reach of regular people. Uh, yourself excluded. I paint real people who are flawed people, <laughs> who who uh, self excluded. Um, who uh, the, the attempt is to remind people that they don't have to be, you know, um, Frederick Douglass uh, or Abraham Lincoln to be included as a portrait of America, they'll tell the truth. All they have to do is, is do something courageous or, or with great perseverance uh, for some social justice issue. And, you know, I might end up painting them. I mean, it, and I, and I, you know, the, the most difficult thing about this is not choosing people, it's choosing whom not to paint. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. really, that's really hard because so there are hundreds of thousands of people who actually deserve a portrait like this. And I just, you know, I'm one guy in a little town in Maine, you know, turning out these portraits and I can't paint everybody. And that's a problem because I get every single day I get emails or calls or something from places saying, geez, why haven't you painted so and so? And I can I, imagine you're overwhelmed with this. Um, yeah. It's it's interesting. You're painting the it's I think it's wonderful. You're painting intentionally flawed human beings uh, in this period when people are tearing down marble statues uh, because people's beliefs are out of dates with the century we're living in. Uh, we could put up statues of these people in these books, but someday we might be against uh, fossil fuel burning or meat eating or wars or, uh, or prisons or, and there's gonna be something that each of these people, including me, you know, did that would get our marble statues torn down. But if they're paintings of flawed individuals who did at least one thing that was good, uh, then you don't really need to rip them up later, right? Uh, we, we don't need to rip them up later. Yeah, it, it's, and I doubt that that would be the case. I mean, the, 
the thing is that you know the society and the culture we lived in, our political and economic society, embed us all so deeply in you know not only our personal flaws but the flaws of the society that we all, no matter what we stand for, at least I'm speaking for myself, and you know we can't help but be involved in the things that are antithetical to um, you know so just and 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 uh, healthy life on this planet. And that's that's the thing that I, I think is one of the, the issues that's most difficult for us is that we can't escape how attached we are to all these inimical problems. And you've you've painted a wide range of people, not just peace advocates. You have at least a couple other similar books, one about earth justice and one about racial justice. How many how many types of people have you painted and how many portraits have you done? Well, there's, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure right now, but it's a, it's a uh, approximately 280 portraits. When I began this uh, in the run up to the Iraq War, I mean, that's what got me started in this. I, I did, I was not a portrait painter. I had, I had never painted a portrait. Uh, I and I had no real ambition to become anything other than a surrealist, is what I was. Uh, but I was overwhelmed by as I'm sure you were too, and, and many uh, people were, by a government that was lying to create a war that never should have been fought, that was in fact a crime against humanity and a war crime. I mean, it was the kind of preemptive war that we hung you know, uh, Nazis for after World War II. Uh, that's what we were doing. And it was, if one wanted to you know, really read the, the accounts of uh, the weapons inspectors and other people, we should have known or we did know or could have known or the, if the major media had been doing their job that we were being propagandized, we were being lied to, we were being fed all kinds of fear and racism and fundamentalism to create the atmosphere for this war. And I could no longer, I mean, every adult, every, uh, in my adult life, I'm 77 years old, you know, ever since, I was a young person during Vietnam. Every war that has been part of my lifetime has been, you know, brought to us with lying of one kind or another. These have all been war crimes. And I just couldn't go on with my life anymore thinking I've got to take some kind of a stand here and I've got to do the thing that I do best, which is paint and use that as a voice at this time to say, I, I have to resist this. I have to resist it in to the most articulate defiance that I can possibly muster. And I also um, have to do it with a sense of love, though, that I can't just show people that I'm enraged that, a, that another war is about to take place and all the damage and, and you know personal damage, environmental damage is going to happen because of it. But I can show that um, there's something else going on here, that you can take that anger and that rage and use that energy of that in the service of love by painting people that you admire, that also keep you feeling a little less alienated from the country you happen to live in that's doing these criminal things. And also, you know, it was, it was a simple question of sanity too. I mean, when you're involved with some large entity, which happens to be your government, that is lying to you again and again, the question of sanity becomes really important. How do you navigate this time and feel sane in yourself when all around you are, is, is a sea of lies. And I, I just had to reattach myself as strongly as I could to uh, a sense of sanity through people who have been courageous and defiant in standing up for the, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the original values of the country. It's how they've been employed and for whom they've been employed. That's the problem. And um, so reattaching to those values and doing it through the people who had the courage to insist on them for themselves and for other people was was my road to both uh, dealing with alienation and um, keeping my morals intact and keeping my sanity. Well, it's, I forgot, I've forgotten now the original question you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> so have I. It will come back to it, I'm sure. I, I, you, have, you have inspired and educated a great many people with this. Um, and I, I think you're something of a writer as well. Each, uh, each portrait has a quote on it from the subject of the portrait and then a page next to it uh, 
a, a short biography of the person in in words. Uh, and you also have a preface uh, to this book that you wrote that uh, I, I think is focused largely on the problem that we have a, a war culture and you're making a contribution to, to having a peace culture, to having a culture where people hear about and see and, and, and recognize and celebrate uh, those who've worked for peace and victories that have been won for peace. Um, is, that, is that a big part of your motivation? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I grew up in, in Southern Ohio in the 19, when I was born in 1946, right at the you know close of World War II, a uh, year after. I, and then my childhood of the 50s and 60s was, um, you know, just in, in overwhelmed with war stories and the greatness of the, the good war. And um, those were the heroes we were given and all the values that are good values, you know, about heroism, perseverance, honesty, trust, loyalty, you know, all those things uh, were embodied, we were told, in the life of a soldier, a good soldier. And I grew up, you know, sitting in my room, at, in, in my little playroom, in my bedroom, playing with little soldiers on the floor and, and you know, having big campaigns of them killing each other. And, uh, you know, one war after another, my my little green lead soldiers fought it out and I provided all the the uh, motivation and the antics and the and the terror and the, you know, the thrill of winning and all that sort of stuff was all done you know through those little games and then I you know like so many kids and they still do you know you, you're you're I mean today our our culture is even more saturated with with weapons or, or pseudo weapons that young kids could have to train them to be you know, in that mode. And, and of course, now it's all electronic too. just the act of, of killing and feeling comfortable with that. And, and not only is it, it is something that excites you, but it's somehow good that you you do these things and learn that learn to be a good soldier. So I, I grew up that way until and it all seemed uh, fairly consistent and, and not uh, particularly jarring to me until the Vietnam War. When I was on the brink of being drafted into to the Vietnam War, and I had also been, you know, uh, uh, going to lectures by Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky and anti-war people like that, and beginning to understand, you know, this whole problem on on several levels. One, there was the particular war, and what we were being told about why we were fighting this war, and why it needed to be fought, and then there was just the history of of U.S. war making, and so. <clears throat> That's when I had to make a, a real decision. You know, was I going to allow myself now to become the little toy soldier that I had played with as a kid, um, and for somebody else's benefit, or was I going to figure out my own what my own moral center was, and then to be able to stand up for that? I mean, so many people I know who are friends now and, and veterans for peace, you know, came to that same moment and couldn't make that decision. That what they had to do was do what they thought was the right thing, which was to submit themselves, you know, to the military, you know, for the good of the country, you know, all that business. And, you know, not either not knowing or not wanting to know what the real truth was about why they were being told to do these things. So I, you know, I resisted the draft and that in, in doing that, it enabled me to, I think it was a, probably that was the first really hard thing I did as a moral you know, individual was say, I'm not going to take part in this war. And that being able to make that decision, turn in my draft card, was um, enabled then further decisions. Once you realize you could do that, you can actually go through that process of saying, I won't do this, even though it makes you feel so isolated and so uh, at the mercy of then of this great force that you're trying to stand up against um the doing of it enables you to go on living like that which is um you know and then you know these portraits then are of many people who did that in many different ways 
thinking maybe there should be one more, a self-portrait in here somewhere. <laughs> um, we're, we're speaking with Robert Shetterly about the book Portraits of Peacemakers, Americans Who Tell the Truth, which is just coming out um, with a, a, a launch event happening, and I'm sure numerous events happening. Uh, you, you've done such a wonderful job of having educational events and lectures and and exhibitions and films about your work. Um, I think you've you've not only painted powerful portraits, but uh, you've done an incredible job of of promoting it and educating people with it. Um, how, how have you managed this? Well, it was um, a total surprise. That was not my intention. I thought I would paint a handful of pictures, maybe maybe five, maybe 10 portraits that they would act as a kind of therapy for me to get through the difficult time of the run up to the Iraq war. I was not thinking that uh, I was gonna have a show that was gonna go around the country and it would enable me to go into schools and colleges and, and or in adult groups and talk to them about history. And I mean, this was not my field, you know, and I, I did not expect that at all, but a very peculiar thing happened. I had, I showed, when I had 17 portraits, I showed them in a little library here in Maine. And I got a call from a man who said that he was a, a retired U.S. diplomat, a man named Bob Sargent. And he said that he'd seen the show and it should be a national traveling show and that he would he would help me do that. Um, I was stunned. I mean, that hadn't been on my radar at all. Yeah. And so I met with Mr. Sargent, who was about 10 years older than I am. And uh, we began to work together. And he knew something about uh, organizing a traveling exhibition. And so th that's where the first shows happened. We, we, he knew some colleges that had, he had worked with before. And all of a sudden I was shipping portraits to Iowa or to, you know, or Kentucky or something like that. And then trundling after them to give talks. And I was totally unprepared for, for being able to give a talk. I, I, that was, I, as a the kind of artist I'd been has been the kind of mostly hides out in his studio and sends odd pictures out into the world. Now I was inverting that and with having to uh, be, become a public person and also know something about what I was talking about. So that was that was. It also turned out that Bob Sargent had been in the CIA. He didn't tell me that at first, but what he did tell me though, which was so interesting, was that he thought that secrecy had become. Uh, the greatest problem for democracy. And here was a CIA man, retired CIA man, who still believed in some of the things the CIA had done, but he understood that secrecy was ruining democracy. And, you know, you know today we look at that and say, not just, of course, the, the intelligence agencies that are secret, but most of our government is secret in one way or another because it's hidden behind, you know, false, you know, information and, and, and propaganda about what's really going on. Right, and and the justification is war. If you didn't have war, if you didn't have these designated enemies, you couldn't justify the secrecy. But I think this traveling show uh, has opened doors with this wonderful art that couldn't have been opened by many of the people depicted in these portraits. They, some of them wouldn't get into these classrooms, these universities, uh, but you get in there with a portrait of them and tell their story. And I think that's a wonderful that's, thing. That's fascinating. Yeah. And it's, you're exactly right. I've often said that, that I, the, the people themselves often get, wouldn't get invited. The people I painted wouldn't get invited to the same places, you know, to talk in a middle school or, or an elementary school or, you know, some colleges, they just wouldn't get that, you know, but for some reason, um, making a painting that aspires to be real art, so that there's that artistic connection. It isn't just a placard, you know, an anti-war placard with a quote scribbled on it. It's It really tries to be a real piece of art. And people trust the art and they will invite the art there even though it's an, antithetical to their own politics. It, at least that's what they think at the time. And then I get in there and I can start talking about a person like you, or, you know, uh, I painted a portrait of, of Daniel Hale. You know, Daniel Hale was uh, the um, um, drone pilot uh, who refused to fly anymore because he realized that um, 
for several things. Well, he realized several things. One was that drones were killing often, you know, nine out of 10 people that they killed were innocent, many of them children, many of them women, many of them, yes. Yeah, there's Daniel Hale. If you're and, watching the video, I'm holding up Daniel Hale. So for, you know, for, um, you know, for him, uh, when he came, realized he had to come to terms with what he was being ordered to do and then what he was agreeing to do. And he realized that this was highly immoral, that, it, that his, for his own soul, basically, he couldn't keep doing this. Uh, he had to make a choice about following orders or and, and, and killing innocent people or refusing altogether. And of course, then he was sent to prison for blowing the whistle on, on what drone pilots were actually doing. And the uh, and this is all going a lot of it. Most, the worst of this going on during the Obama administration, uh, where there's so many people were being killed with with drones in, in Afghanistan in particular, but all over the place. And people like Daniel Hale, who had been, you know, wanted to do something good for the country, found themselves like so many soldiers, uh, doing things that are ordered to do things that are were causing their own moral injury, and he had to choose whether to do that or not, and chose not to do it. Yeah. What are, uh, what's another example or two of the stories in this book that you found to have the greatest educational impact, that, that people are most interested to learn who this person was? Because you have a, you have a huge variety of whistleblowers and activists and educators and politicians and uh, authors. Um, what, what stories, uh, if any, stand out as as? So, so there, there's a bunch of them. I mean, they all stand out one way or another. But I think there's another one that is uh, is very is is similar to to Daniel Hale, which probably again most people don't know about, is that the the first soldier to refuse to continue to fight in Iraq was a a man named Camila Mahila Mahia, and he was a a young man who was living in Miami. Um, you know, Florida, and uh, had had finished college, but he wanted money to go to graduate school, and he was out of money. So he joined the military, and that was his. You know, he thought this was his ticket to higher education, finish his education. And of course, the thing that happened to him next was that he was in showed up. You know, all of a sudden he'd gone through basic training, and there he was in Iraq. And and once in Iraq, what he was doing was being ordered uh, to sometimes shoot at civilians. And other times to uh, torture prisoners that he that they had captured, and he just, you know, was going a little bit crazy, uh, realizing the burden of what he had done, and why he had done it, and whether the question was whether he could continue to do it. So he came home on on leave and went AWOL. You know, it just he thought he'd run away, and then he realized that being AWOL was not the solution to his problem. The solution was to face it, you know, to say to the military, you made me do these things. I will not do it anymore. I'm not going back. So he turned himself in. He was sentenced to a year in prison. And the reason though that I think I became aware of him, I was aware of the time when he first uh, refused. He was one of, he was the first, I think, to go to prison, who first soldier uh, over Iraq, but was what he said. You know, we have in this country some, people who have gone to, to uh, prison who have made great you know, statements in the courtroom before they were sentenced. Uh, and his was one of those great ones. And if your readers can find that, Camilo Mejia's uh, you know, courtroom statement, because what he said was that was, was just challenge, challenging everything that we accept about militarism. He said to people, you know, you, you call me a coward now because I wouldn't fight. He said, well, I was a coward, but it wasn't because I could, wouldn't fight. He said, I would fight. I did. I fired my gun. I killed people. He said, that wasn't the problem. What I was a coward for was not doing what I really believed in, which is, was acting on this war, uh, against this war. He said, that's why I was a coward, and that's what I'm trying to remedy now. And then he said, but being in prison behind these bars, I'm finally a free person. I mean, he, you know, it's these playing with the anomaly of being actually imprisoned, but actually being free at the same time. I'm sure, I mean, I, 
I painted, um, you know, Philip Berrigan, who spent probably 14 years of his life in prison for all of his anti-war activities, and his his portraits in this book too. And that's, you know, he, that's what he was doing. You know, was he realized that the only place he could be free in an immoral society was in prison. Uh, I mean, his his feelings were that uh, clear to him. You know, and and demanded that he do those anti-war things. You know, whether it's you know, pouring his own blood on draft files or stealing them and burning them up with napalm or, you know, hammering on the head of a war, you know, a missile or something like that. I mean, he sent himself basically to prison in order to be free again and again and again. Um, Indeed. One of the, um, another one that was just such an interesting story was, um, and it became very personal for me, was Cindy Sheehan. I don't know if many people today or even aware of her anymore. I mean, that her her moment yeah. sort of uh, was there and then it was gone. Uh, I mean, she's not the figure that she was at the early stages of the Iraq war when her son, uh, Casey, was, was drafted into the Iraq war and he was signed up to be a mechanic. And when he arrived in Iraq, they sent him in an open truck through the streets of Baghdad. And his first day there, a sniper shot him through the head. And uh, you know, she had tried to encourage him not to go go to Iraq because but he thought it was after 9-11 that it was his duty, you know, that this was protecting America. But he did not want to be a soldier, he wanted to be a, a supporter, he wanted to be a mechanic. And he was killed. And um Cindy then became this incredible, uh, incredibly courageous person uh who traveled around the country trying to get people to understand how immoral the war was. And she also took it very personally as though, yeah, that, I'll, I'll say a little story about that painting in a second here, but. Um, we, we have about one minute left, Robert, so. Oh, oh it, really? It, it, I'm she free, was, so I'd like to was, go for hours. I was showing these paintings to her, the ones I had done, and she was sitting in my basement and she had been crying all morning. She couldn't talk about her son without crying. And that look that's on her face there is because her eyes were still wet with tears, you know? And uh, then she's the one who started Camp Casey. She's the one who, who camped out in the ditch outside of George Bush's you know, ranch in, in Crawford, Texas. Um, and, and started that whole movement of, of sort of reinvigorated the, the, the anti-war movement just by herself because of her grief for her son. And her shame that she hadn't been able to stop him from going into the, the military. It's it's a powerful expression on the face of a powerful person who, like many of these people I know, others I did not know, others I did not even know of, and have been educated uh, by this book. And they're all looking straight at you. And there's some are more happy and some are more sad, but they all look like they want to tell you this story. Um, and it, it's an incredible work. Uh, and I recommend everybody get a copy. It's called Portraits of Peacemakers, Americans Who Tell the Truth by our guest, Robert Shetterly. You can also go to the website, americanswhotellthetruth.org. Robert Shetterly, thank you for everything you've been doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks, David. It's such a pleasure to see you and to be with you. And and just I just have to say a little something about you. Your books, you know, have educated me incredibly. Uh, you know, your books about uh, militarism and war making and the lies that that uh, enable war have been hugely influential in my life. And I I don't know if I could have done this work without your you know, your your scholarship. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.